you should come to any suggestions doctor if you are a huge fan of doctor who um but also if you're not a big fan of doctor who we'll tell you everything there is to know you know i think one of the things that i i really uh, do enjoy about this show is that it is completely accessible um we always make a point at the start of the show of being like hey give us a big cheer if you're a big fan of doctor who but also give us a big cheer if you've just been dragged along by one of your friends <laughs> and uh sometimes sometimes those barometers are slightly more skewed <laughs> than we might expect um I think we've only ever once had a crowd where we said, give me a cheer, you've been dragged along by a friend, and there was silence. Um, but we've definitely had times where that second cheer is a little bit bigger, and we're like, okay, cool. So um, it's always going to be a show that is fun. Um, it's, as I say, it's appropriate for people of all ages. Uh, it's exciting. It's an adventure. It can go anywhere in time and space. We've got a literal TARDIS on stage with us. We can go wherever you want we can do whatever you want um and uh you know yeah we're gonna drop in uh the doctor who references for the big fans but it's not going to be completely in inaccessible we're gonna take you along for the ride like trust me i'm not i'm not the doctor who expert you know <laughs> like i have to spend as much time cribbing up before shows just reading up on the tardis wikia to be like okay let's in that past episode, we had such and such a character. Who actually are they so that I can figure this out in case they come up in future? Um, you know, so yeah, it's, it is completely accessible. Um, so if you're a huge fan of Doctor Who, great, come along. You're going to love all that. If you're not a fan of Doctor Who, but you do just want a good fun hour of uh, an exciting adventure with a really tight plot that, as I say, can go anywhere in time and space. Uh, any suggestions, Doctor? The improvised Doctor Who parody is the show for you. Hi, I'm Charles Dean. Uh, director and performer with Any Suggestions Improv. Uh, I'm doing a conversation about Any Suggestions Doctor, the improvised Doctor Who parody. And if you want to learn a little bit more about us and about our show, then please uh, listen along, uh, and I hope you enjoy what I have to say. The show, um, basically when you show up to uh, Any Suggestions Doctor, you'll be queuing outside, um, and a couple of us in the cast will come out, and we will hand you, in fact, I think I've got a couple here, um, we'll hand you some of our um, episode title slips that we have here, um, and we invite you to write down the name of a hypothetical episode of Doctor Who that you have never, ever seen before, um, but you've always wanted to see made. Um, we do try to encourage people that it is an hour of whimsy and wonder. Um, we don't want to be doing an hour of modern political discourse um, we're not satirists, and indeed it is a family show, you know. So if you want to sit through an hour of Doctor Who versus Donald Trump, I think you're probably in the minority, to be completely honest. Um, so we try and discourage people from doing that. And of course, it's a family show, so if people have anything rude they want to write down, we go, look, we're not going to read that out in front of children, as it were. Um, so we ask people to write those down. They hand those to uh, one of our other cast members on the way in. We put them into a big box to pull one out of. Um, and essentially, the the way the show is structured is we have three questions to ask. We have Doctor Who, um, who of us is going to be the cast, um, or sorry, who who is going to be the cast? Who of us is going to be the Doctor? We're all going to be the cast, but who out of us is going to be playing the Doctor? Um, uh, we ask Doctor where and when in time and space. So this is where we try to get the setting from the audience. Um, and we sort of invite people to, you know, shout out potential settings. We've had some, like, really, really incredible settings in the past. Um, you know, uh, I think some of the more creative ones that sort of spring to mind are uh, we once were, had an episode set in the source mines of Heinz 57, which I remember just hearing out loud. And I was like, yeah, that's evocative. That's exactly what we want. But we also clearly have that setting there. Um, but also doing, like, the the historical settings are really fun. We've done, like, the first Olympics um, we've been to ancient Egypt a few times. Um, we've even been to like more recent history. Like we have done um, a couple of set in like World War Two. Um, we even did one uh, in uh, like the Korean War, um, which was great because functionally the Korean War is not something that we as British people know a huge amount about. It's not necessarily like in our education. So I'm sure it was an incredibly accurate depiction of exactly what happened in the Korean War. Um, but we also get a lot of, uh, you know, contemporary settings. You know, we get a lot of people who, for some reason, want us to go to retail outlets. So we've been to Ikea a couple of times. 
Um, just the other day, we went to Big Tesco, um, which I'm sure to a lot of your uh, American audience won't necessarily mean just as much. But all you need to know is that there is a supermarket chain called Tesco, and there is uh, there are small Tescos, and there is Big Tesco. And Big Tesco is a thrill, let's just say that. Um, but, you know, we've also had a lot more sort of like... Uh, ambiguous but contemporary settings a really fun one we did last year was in a uh norwegian fjord um and that was just like really really evocative because then we get to sort of like play with okay so we're in norway what are the norwegian things we're going to bring into this but also how do we then tie it to the final question doctor what is the episode title um because whatever that setting happens to be we then have to tie it to whatever we happen to pull out of that hot hot out of that hat um, whether it is Doctor and the Octopus uh, when Donna met Strax or the cat's calling, you know. Um, so we've got, you know, we've got to tie all those things t- together. So once we've got those um, three suggestions uh, from the audience, we take it away. And it we it is then just an episode of Doctor Who, you know. We've got our little cold open to set things up. We've got our opening title screen. Um, and uh, we go we go throughout. Um you know, in terms of who might show up in that adventure, obviously we will always have a doctor um, and uh, there will always be the doctor's companion, whoever that happens to be. And that's another really fun thing to play around with. Like, you know, what do you tend to expect from um, a doctor's companion and how can we maybe toy with those expectations a little bit? Um, You know, in the past, sometimes we've just literally been like, hey, this companion happens to be French. Um, one of my favorite ones from Fringe's past is whenever I just decided my companion was Winston Churchill um, after the companion had walked on stage. And so now it's like, well, okay, for the next hour, you're playing Winston Churchill. Have fun. Um, but beyond that, um, it absolutely depends from show to show. And it will always be the um, most appropriate uh, callbacks and so on. Like, obviously, sometimes the episode title that we happens to get will sort of summon, if you will, um, a uh, a character, what happen- whatever it happens to be. You know, if its title happens to invoke, as I had there, Donna, well, we're going to see Donna at some point. If it happens to mention, oh, it's the cyber invasion, well, we're obviously going to have some Cybermen, or if the Daleks are mentioned, or the Adipose, um, or whatever it happens to be. Um, and indeed, sometimes the setting will mandate it. You know, we have done a couple of episodes set in sort of classic Doctor Who uh, locations, you know, whether it's Gallifrey, whether it's Scaro, whether it's Mondas. Um, uh, that was a really fun one as well, because sort of like the ongoing conceit of the whole episode was like, what what are the things that make Earth and Mondas different, but also the same? Um, so, yeah. Uh, and of course, sometimes it, it's not necessarily dictated by the setting or the title. It's just dictated by wherever the plot happens to go. Um, and in fact, I mentioned the uh, adipose earlier. Um, you know, we haven't done the adipose much. They're one; they only kind of appeared in, uh, I think, technically a couple. But in terms of like as a main, uh, not even so much villain, sort of ambivalent accidental problems um, in one particular episode uh, years ago. Um, but we had an episode that was set inside the human body, and as the plot developed, there was clearly something going wrong with this person that they had some an issue inside them, and it turned out to be the adipose. And I remember standing off stage, and the moment that was invoked, I was just like, "Yes, that's correct. That's absolutely what should be going on here." You know, and that's part of the joy of improv is sort of sitting off stage or indeed on stage, of course, someone revealing who they are, revealing what what actually the scheme is, and you're like. Of course, of course it's that. It absolutely makes sense. Um, From time to time, we do have our own sort of more uh, original uh, villains um, that don't necessarily invoke uh, particular things. I mean, you know, a couple of years ago, we had a couple of episodes where we had brand new Time Lords that we'd never met before, like the Cheese Sommelier. Um, We also had an episode the other night where uh, the main villain was actually one of the jelly babies from classic Doctor Who that sort of was now out for revenge, having been uh, abandoned back in the 70s. Um, And indeed, another uh, another great example was, um, I always think back to this episode, but it was one we did either 20, I think it might have been 2017, maybe 2018. um, And it was set in Machu Picchu. And uh, there was this really strong, you know, plot and scheme going on where essentially someone was trying to block out the sun and they were building a bit like in that episode of The Simpsons, you know, where Mr. Burns builds his big sun blocking device. Um, Someone's trying to block out the sun from the entire earth. 
And it was really, really like fun episode, really, really evocative episode. But I was playing the doctor and even I'm kind of going, I don't actually really know. You know, we're, we're getting relatively, you know, like two thirds of the way through this. And I'm not really sure who the villain is. What like we know what the scheme is. And again, Doctor Who is a mystery. But we're really not sure. Like, no one has sort of, like, latched onto that thing of, like, ah, of course, this is being done by the master. This is being done by whoever. So I essentially just threw something out there. And I turned to my companion, um, who was being played by Matthew, and I said, uh, I can't remember what their name I think their name might have been Jeanette. And I said, and I said, Jeanette, who in the world hates the sun the most? And Matthew, kind of in a moment of, like, blind panic, just went, oil barons? And I just immediately went, yes, oil barons hate the sun because they hate solar power because that's going to take away all of their wealth. And it was just that sort of moment of serendipity where I was just like, Matthew, give me a hand here. Tell me what you think is going on. And I was sort of like half anticipating them to say, uh, OK, you know, what? it's going to be the Daleks. It's going to be the Cybermen. It's going to be whatever. And instead, they just in that moment of panic said something functionally completely random. And I was just like, yes. You know, like, I don't want to be too cliche about, like, yes and an improv, but I was like, of course it's Oil Barons. It makes perfect sense it's Oil Barons, and here's the really good reason behind it. So, you can get absolutely anything. You know, you could get some classic villains, you could get some new ones, or you could get some of our sort of, like, twists on uh, more classic Doctor Who tropes. The story of how we came to do specifically Doctor Who is kind of interesting. Um, essentially, the most of us in our sort of like core cast um we come from we're fans of like the modern reboot doctor who sort of russell t davis era uh brings it back um you know that period um but you have a couple of cast members who have a bit more knowledge of sort of like historical doctor who um but on the whole what uh, draw drew us to the property and indeed what draws like most of our audience to the property is everything that's happened sort of post 2005 and um, to be frank, um, it was at some point during the Peter Capaldi era of Doctor Who. I mean, evidently, this was, I say, this 2015, 2016. And, um, you know, I will speak purely for myself. I'm not, I don't want to speak too much for everyone else from the cast, but I found a lot of Stephen Moffat's show running to be a little more frustrating. Um, you know, and, and in particular, I, I, I sometimes thought, I don't really feel like this is for kids. You know, like there were some times where I thought it was a little too dark, a little bit too serious or whatever. Plenty of fun stuff that did happen. And I did really love like Peter Capaldi as Doctor. Um, but there's just parts of that era where I was thinking like, oh, this is this just feels like a drag. Um, and essentially, there was a particular episode um, that aired, and a couple of days later, a bunch of us were all just sitting in the pub, having a few drinks. We've been discussing various things, but we talked about this episode in particular, and we sort of thought, man, that was that was not great. We could have improvised a better episode than that. Ah, ha, 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 ha. You know, like, not really thinking anything further than that. And so it wasn't until, as I say, Lewis had sat us down and we were brainstorming, okay, we're going to t we want to take a show up to the fringe next year. Uh, what do we want it to be? And someone brought up, we did bring up, we could improvise Doctor Who. Okay, yeah, we'll put that on the list. And we had a few other things on there, but we kept coming back to Doctor Who. We kept coming back to, this feels like a really strong idea. Um, and in hindsight, I think we're absolutely correct. I think one of the things that's really fun about um, doing an improvised Doctor Who is that it can be set literally anywhere. Um, you know, like you have a time machine that can go through all of time and space and you can pick any location, any time period. Um, you can make up any location, any time period and bam, you're there. And it makes sense. You know, you don't have to do um the thing that you know sometimes improv shows have to do or sort of like tiptoeing around justifying well why do we happen to be in this sort of futuristic robot factory it's like no we're in a futuristic robot factory it just exists that's fine that's the world you know we can skip over that level of of plot explanation because like yeah this is where we are and that's what doctor who does as well like there's there's they they don't really labor the justification of why these things exist they just go yeah this exists because it does it's like cool great let's get on with the adventure um so yeah, we just kept coming back to it until eventually we went, well, all right, let's let's give it a go. Um and 
we we had a few different ideas for what we would name it like um like i'm really happy with uh the, the name we've come up with any suggestions doctor i think it's nice and evocative but also at that point i think it's fair to say in terms of the sort of parody area um you know although we are protected by sort of parody law and so on and so forth we didn't want to just explicitly say the doctor who improv show <laughs> so it was evocative of uh doctor who without like explicitly saying anything um but we had some other ideas i think one of the ones that really stuck with me was we came up with the name impromptu who um which out loud uh like i think it's, i remember like i was coming up that and i was like man that's so i really love that that's so clever that's so whatever um you know and it really uh gets across like the sort of like the improvised nature of it while also having who in there a bit of wordplay love a bit of wordplay um but then written down it just looks like impromptu which isn't anything at all so so we settled on any suggestions doctor um and we started developing from there um and it is a like it's a big property to tackle of course it is um you know and it's a big property that a lot of people are very very passionate about and that's part of why we put so much work into developing exactly what we wanted from the show exactly what we wanted to deliver from the show when we were during some of the earlier uh workshopping and brainstorming periods we thought at one point okay do we want to um you know do we want each of us to sort of take on um a couple of incarnations of the doctor so that if hypothetically i become the doctor you know i could be uh you know Chris, christopher eccleston but i could also be tom baker whatever the happen if that happens to be um and after we'd done a few more workshops like that we realized we're not impressionists you know <laughs> um we're we're improvisers um so we scrapped that we moved away from that and we realized that actually gave us a lot more freedom in terms of sort of parody and pastiche and so on because it means that uh you know if i happen to be portraying the doctor i can take a couple of the things i like from a couple of my favorite doctors but i can also like play around with them and i can twist them a bit um you know one of my favorite things i've ever done uh with the doctor um is to sort of the Doctor is a, an incredibly intelligent character. You know, they know everything. They know absolutely everything. They have all the knowledge. They have all the expertise and know-how. And one of the things I find fun to sometimes do if I'm being the Doctor is actually to be a little bit more sort of dim-witted, if you know what I mean, <laughs> and sort of taking a bit more of a back seat. And actually, it's kind of the companion who has all of the, like, uh, implicit knowledge and know-how of the area. And I'm sort of, like, following their lead a little bit more, but also still ultimately being the one to save the day in whatever way, shape, or form that should take. Um, and it again, it also gives us a lot more freedom to play around with other tropes of what being the doctor means. You know, like doctor is, uh, you know, never cowardly, always kind. Well, what if they're a little bit cowardly? You know, or <laughs> what if what if they're a little bit mean? Or what if they just acknowledge from time to time? I know I say I never kill anyone, but I've done a genocide of the Daleks like four times by this point. You know, I've I've killed all of the Time Lords a dozen times. You know, like more if the Doctor was a little bit more self-aware that like, OK, they're a bit self-aggrandizing, but actually this is all a bit hypocritical. Um, but even playing around with some of the other characters as well. One of my favorite things that um, we we do from time to time is when we're playing the Daleks. Um, we sort of inevitably end up, you know, in actual Doctor Who, if Daleks do have names, they tend to be quite uh, sort of intimidating or ethereal names of some sort, you know, like Dalek Khan, Dalek Sek. We always end up calling them like Dalek Barry, Dalek Elaine, you know, <laughs> and then they just end up having this much more like domestic relationship with each other. Um, you know, I think one of my favorite examples of a way where the doctor had not necessarily defeated the Daleks, but intimidated them was to just be like, if you don't stop your scheme, I'm going to tell your dad. And they're like, no, don't tell dad. Um, and just, you know, really sort of playing around with that side of things. Um, you know, you don't want to go too far down that line because obviously we do want it to be ultimately as much as we want it to be like a fun show, a funny show. We also do still want it to have everything that doctor who is, you know, doctor who, crosses so many genres one of those genres of course is comedy but those other genres are like you've got drama you've got mystery but the thing i really want to try and hammer home as much as we can is that horror side of things you know doctor who is a lot of the time a horror show and i think when it is at its best it is when it really is like making you feel uneasy uncomfortable um 
and you you know the doctor is going to save the day, but actually not everyone's going to get out of this okay. Um, and the times we have done that in, in our show have been the most magical times that I think I personally as a performer have ever had. The show has definitely evolved a lot since 2016. Um, as I say, I think in 2016, we were, you know, it, as I say, it was it, it had a much more of a vibe of like we are kids in a toy box. We're getting out there. We're doing the sort of like fairly obvious Doctor Who jokes a lot of the time, and you know it's it's very fun. And we did have, of course, a couple of really great plots in there. Um, but I think it's fair to say, probably looking back at that, it's a lot more rudimentary. And I honestly think one of the things that really helped us take the show to the next level was getting a live score getting our live radiophonic workshop excuse me um you know so in that first year we um had a guy called uh alex rushforth and he sort of like helped sort of frame a lot of that music and so on um and uh we now work with a guy called nick upton who's uh you know a, a terrific musician as well um and I think one of the things that's been really helpful about having that musical score backing it is that helps to steer the scenes as much as anything else. Um, you know, when previously we were kind of just using like pre-recorded background tracks um, that functionally are kind of quite stagnant, it's fair to say, or, or at the very least predictable. You know, like if you've heard like this sort of like, you know, background track once and then you're doing a show like a few days later, like, okay, yeah, I know exactly what the tone of this scene is kind of going to be. Whereas having the live music in there allows um, Nick and whoever happens to be doing the music for us to help steer or direct the scene. If sometimes, you know, sometimes it does, we might be feeling a little bit aimless, but if he just gives us like that little, you know, twinkly uplifting tone behind it, that lets us know, oh, okay, you know what, maybe we should pick up the mood a bit. Or indeed, if it gets more sinister and it's like, nope, guess what? Now this scene means bad news is afoot. Um, so that's been really useful. But also, I think one of the things that's been quite fun for us is watching um, Doctor Who, the TV show, evolve as well and seeing how we can take advantage of that what are the different tonal shifts in there um you know i think as i say the end of stephen moffat's run and uh certainly large parts of chris chibnall's run i think have had a much more like dark tone to them um which as i say for a family show for a show that is for kids i don't necessarily know if i'm like as fully on board with but it means we can then like play with that okay what does it mean if we are going to have a more dark and sinister thing to it you know I can't tell you the number of times where we've had the companion in our episode face actual mortal peril and where, you know, we've had audiences like actually gasping. Like I remember there being one time we did an episode where, um, so at basically the end of Chris Chibnall's uh, run, um, his companion Bill gets turned into a Cyberman. And like one of those episodes ends with, with Bill as the side, as a Cyberman being like Dr. I waited and it's this like harrowing moment where you're like, wow, the, not only has the doctor like allowed Bill to come to harm, but like this is one of the most horrifying things that could possibly happen. They've been turned into a Cyberman and that's not something that you can just, you know, magic away. You know, that has happened now. And, you know, we uh, were doing another episode where sort of um, I uh, was uh, I was the companion and uh, the plot of the episode essentially was that the Daleks were turning people into Daleks. And I sort of thought, um, okay, great. This is a great thing to invoke. You know, we're doing parody. We're doing pastiche. We will do the homage to this. And everyone's going to be laughing at this great reference we have done. And instead, I come out and say, you know, very similar line of Doctor, I waited. And the audience, like, all audibly gasp in horror. And I, I'm kind of on stage being like, that's not the reaction I was looking for. But that's incredible. <laughs> you know, we have made them care that much that they are gasping in horror. And I love getting that reaction out of people. And it's something we, I do think we have become much better at. You know, we've become much better at allowing the plot and the narrative to drive what's happening ahead of forcing ourselves into the joke. You know, we, we all, um, well, m most of us anyway, sort of come from more of a short form uh, background and in you know a lot of short form improv you are punching for the joke much sooner than than anything else whereas in a narrative thing sometimes if you go for the joke that's going to undermine like the plot and the narrative and one of the things i have tried to uh encourage everyone to remember is that 
um, you know, it's that thing of truth in comedy, right? If you've built a scene, if you've built a world, if you've built characters that the audience believe in, when something funny happens, it's going to be much more, get much more of a reaction. When something serious happens, when something sad happens, when something scary happens, it will get much more of a reaction from the audience than if you have built a sort of comedy slapstick character who only really exists to come on, say some funny lines and, you know, do some weird physicality. If something bad then happens to them, the audience aren't going to be horrified. They're going to be like, yeah, yeah, I guess. Um, and I think that's something we have become much better at, is actually allowing ourselves to be drawn more by the narrative, and by the plot, than forcing ourselves into the corner of, we've got to be funny at all times. Some of my favourite moments we've ever done in this show have been completely unfunny, <laughs> completely deadpan serious, like just moments of silence where everyone's just sort of like allowed things to just bed in and sit in for a moment. And then that means when you do get to that more lighthearted moment, or when you do get to the reveal of, hey, guess what? The master has been defeated by their own hubris. It's that much more satisfying for the audience than just if it's nothing but slipping on banana peels and you know <laughs> doing all that sort of like much more zany side of things. Sometimes the show calls for that. Sometimes that's what an audience wants. And we'll absolutely do that as well. But um, yeah, I, I really do uh, appreciate how we have not so much how the plots have developed, but how we have developed as improvisers at creating better plots. I think one of the things that I think is most magical about any suggestions, Doctor, is that, yes, we are doing parody, yes, we are doing pastiche, but we're doing a uh, homage, as much as anything else, to Doctor Who. And Doctor Who is a show that is, at its heart, about love and acceptance and being who you are in front of insurmountable odds. Um and um sorry i i yeah but, uh, um yeah it's it's a really really powerful thing to me you know i think um you know i don't think it's a hot take say the past couple of years in uh in the, in the world have had like a lot of like darker moments a lot more like serious moments you sort of have to look at things and you go wow you know you look at the state of politics you look at the state of like the covid pandemic it's not always been um super uplifting and we do a show that is without fail uplifting and that is almost without fail <laughs> has a really positive message like i think it is really you know as much as i made jokes earlier about the fact that the doctor's done a couple of like genocides in their time overall the doctor does not save the day with violence. The Doctor saves the day with love. And the Doctor saves the day with um, intelligence um, and with community. You know, the number of times of the day has kind of not really even been saved by the Doctor, but it's been saved by the people around them making sacrifices, doing the right thing. And I just love that our show can play a small part of that. You know, that we can give people this message that like hey guess what maybe you're at a you know futuristic water park that has been overtaken by cybermen who are turning all of the water into cyber water that is going to uh, convert everyone here into horrific monstrosities but if you remember who you are if you remember the love you have for other people um then that will save the day, you know, like it is um like it's kind of a joke in Doctor Who circles that the number of times, um, in particular under Stephen Moffat, but Russell T. Davis had the same issue as well, and there's a little bit with Christian as well, but like where love saves the day. The day was saved by the power of love. And like, yeah, that's a bit corny, and yeah, sometimes it's a bit feels like a bit of a cop out, but that's a great message, isn't it? It's a great message that if you uh, love each other um, and if you um, believe in each other and if you support each other and you lift up each other, that you can conquer all. And, you know, especially in improv, you know, like improv is absolutely um, a medium about cooperation, love, support, having each other's back. And to very literally be able to translate that feeling into a narrative 
is such a joy and it does it has it does make me emotional sometimes you know like there were absolutely shows last year where either on stage or off stage afterwards i was just like a little tear in my eye and i was like this is weird you know <laughs> we're doing a show that's ultimately about a time traveling face changing alien um but guess what there was a moment in there that really got to me um and so yeah like the big message that i not just hope this show takes away but that i believe this show sincerely takes away um is that uh, or that the, the people take away from this show my apologies um is that yeah love each other support each other believe in each other and maybe from time to time beat a few aliens <laughs> You should come to any suggestions, Doctor, if you are a huge fan of Doctor Who. Um, but also, if you're not a big fan of Doctor Who, we'll tell you everything there is to know. You know, I think one of the things that I I really uh, do enjoy about this show is that it is completely accessible. Um, we always make a point at the start of the show of being like, hey, give us a big cheer if you're a big fan of Doctor Who. But also give us a big cheer if you've just been dragged along by one of your friends. <laughs> and uh, somet sometimes... Those barometers are slightly more skewed than we might expect. Um, I think we've only ever once had a crowd where we said, give me a cheer, you've been dragged along by a friend, and there was silence. Um, but we've definitely had times where that second cheer is a little bit bigger, and we're like, okay, cool. So um, it's always going to be a show that is fun. Um, it's, as I say, it's appropriate for people of all ages. Uh, it's exciting. It's an adventure. It can go anywhere in time and space we've got a literal tardis on stage with us we can go wherever you want we can do whatever you want um and uh you know yeah we're gonna drop in uh the doctor who references for the big fans but it's not going to be completely in inaccessible we're gonna take you along for the ride like trust me i'm not I'm not the Doctor Who expert, you know? <laughs> like, I have to spend as much time cribbing up before shows, just reading up on the TARDIS wiki to be like, okay, let's... In that past episode, we had such and such a character. Who actually are they so that I can figure this out in case they come up in future? Um, you know, so yeah, it's, it is completely accessible. Um, so if you're a huge fan of Doctor Who, great, come along. You're going to love all that. If you're not a fan of Doctor Who, but you do just want a good fun hour of uh, an exciting adventure with a really tight plot that, as I say, can go anywhere in time and space. Uh, any suggestions, Doctor? The improvised Doctor Who parody is the show for you. So uh, the we do actually have um, another show that we ha have taken up to uh, the Fringe this year. It's an exciting uh, debut for us. Um, it's called Suggestions of the Unexpected. Um, as the name implies, um, it is a uh, sort of improvised homage to shows like Tales of the Unexpected, The Twilight Zone, uh, even a bit of Goosebumps, probably fair to say. Um, it's more like an improvised uh, portmanteau horror story, um, uh, or perhaps not necessarily horror, but uh, let's say cautionary tale. You know, so we get the prompts from the audience and we are going to like tell you a message, an important message about how you should live your life uh, based on those prompts. Um, it's it's really exciting for us. Um, it is an experiment. It's also worth saying. Um, I'm, I'm really uh, looking forward uh, to trying it out. It's going to be in the final week of The Fringe. Um, and uh, yeah, if you want something that's maybe going to be a little bit darker, um, a little bit more late night, not necessarily, you know, bawdy, shall we say, but we're definitely going to be exploring some more uh, serious uh, tones than we might cross in any suggestions, Doctor. Um, so yeah, if you just want an improv experience that's a little bit different than what you've seen before, um, I would uh, be delighted if people would come along to see suggestions of the unexpected as well. Hi, uh, my name is Charles Dean. I am a director and performer with Any Suggestions Improv. Uh, and I'm up here this year with, uh, in particular, Any Suggestions Doctor, the improvised Doctor Who parody. Uh, it's an improvised adventure in time and space. Uh, it's every night at half five at the Pleasant's Ace Dome. Um, and we'd love you to come along and join us on a rip-roaring adventure through time and space in our very own TARDIS to have an adventure with everyone's favourite face-shaping time-travelling alien, the Doctor. I'm Alison Zada. And I'm Valen Shore.
And if you would like to learn more about our musical Chris Kirkpatrick Mess, please, uh, you know, listen to this interview. And we'd love for you to join us at the Edinburgh Fringe in August. Uh, Chris Kirkpatrick Mess came about as an idea 10 years ago. We were at our friends, Laura and Bethany's apartment, and um, we were just joking around as we often did. And we thought, hey, wouldn't it be funny if Chris Kirkpatrick from NSYNC had a Christmas musical about him called Chris Kirkpatrick Fuzz? And it really just should have ended there. <laughs> <laughs> but instead, <laughs> Allison and I, we locked eyes across the room and it was kind of this like, I, I refer to it as a death glare, although the intentions were purer than that. And um you know, we knew we had to at least start it. So we started writing songs in our apartment. We were roommates at the time in Los Angeles. Um, and we would keep coming back together to write it. It was kind of, it kind of became an obsession on its own. It's been through so many rewrites, mm-hmm. so many revisions, so many breaking it down and building it up again from the bottom. Um, yeah, we just, the songs kept coming. And the story kept evolving in ways that made us laugh. And I think we just kept trying to make each other laugh, honestly. And that's why we kept doing it. Yeah. The great thing about working with Valen is that we do have very similar senses of humor, but we also have, you know, we have very different approaches and very different backgrounds and and skill sets. Like she, the music that she is able to hear in her head and then like, put out of her head into the world. I don't even know how anyone does that. It seems like like witchcraft to me, but I'm really, I wish I had that power, but I don't. Um, and then I sometimes like, you know, I'll hear like conversations, which sounds a little loopy, but it's true. And and together we are able to create something um, that I don't think either of us could have done on our own, or I know I couldn't have done it on my own for sure. Um, yeah. And and we would just, over the years, you know, we, we would it was a joke at first, but we were like, if we were going to do it, which we're not going to do because it's so silly, <laughs> we would have a song about this and let's let's just write it. And then we would do that. And then eventually, you know, seven or eight times later, we, we realized we had almost a whole show and we should probably just finish it. And then when um when and the... so we wrote four more songs <laughs> <laughs> and during, um you know, when we were all kind of locked down in 2020, um we had some time on our hands. And at that point, uh, Valen and I were no longer roommates, but we decided to meet up on Zoom and uh, and finish up the show, which we did. So Chris Kirkpatrick Miss, a boy band Christmas musical, is set on Christmas Eve 2009 when Chris Kirkpatrick of the boy band in sync has a big decision to make and he has a chance to make a Christmas wish, but he only has until the clock strikes midnight to make it. And we like to think of it as a combination of a Christmas carol meets It's a Wonderful Life meets in sync. Yep. Alan, do you want to talk about the other characters? <laughs> I mean, the other characters are are, uh, the other members of NSYNC. And with that ensemble feeling of a boy band, um, we've, yeah, they, we kind of, I don't know how to explain it. They change into different ensemble characters. There's a very special angel character played by Allison, um, a throwback to one of the original 90s boy bands. Um, new kids on the block. So there's something for everybody we'd like to think, but especially uh, millennials and Gen Xers. Yeah. The nice thing about having the structure um, be these familiar stories, like a Christmas Carol and it's a wonderful life is that even if you're coming in, not knowing anything about in sync or you're not sure where the story is going, I think that people do feel like, oh, I kind of know because we we know the structure of A Christmas Carol, right? We know it's a wonderful life. It's going to be someone kind of revisiting key moments in their past and and figuring out why they are where they are. Uh, so I think that that gives people something to latch on to. And then we get to take them on this fantastical journey. Yeah. The important main themes of this musical, identity, mm-hmm. discovery, um, and what Allison says that I have always really liked is what happens on the other side of a dream come true. You want to add to that, Allie? Yeah. Yeah. I think that, um, as Valen said, the identity is a huge theme in this and yeah, what happens on the other side of a dream come true? Because, you know, we're all, um, 
everyone in the cast and you know we working on it we, this is from an, a very los angeles place all of us are are people who moved out here for you know industry reasons to try to achieve these dreams and with varying levels of success but it never works out quite the way you picture it when you're you know home in your in your bedroom in your parents house right um and we have no idea what it was like to be an in sync and have that immense success and then have that kind of end um but but also continue um and just be in that like in between place which is where our show takes place um but we have experienced in our own careers you know a lot of ups and downs and near misses and near hits you know so we um we play a lot with that and we try to imagine and explore what what it is like to kind of achieve that thing that you wanted but maybe it didn't go exactly as planned and what would happen if you're Chris Kirkpatrick from In Singa 2009, and you get visited by a Christmas angel, and he takes you on a journey about your life with In Sync. Yeah, I mean, and we <laughs> like we have no way that that probably didn't happen. You know, we made that up, but who's to say? Um, but yeah, we we just had a lot of fun with it, and overall, it's 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 just supposed to be a joyous Christmas celebration. It's a feel good show. We want people to walk out of it feeling um, feeling happy and and positive and optimistic about the future. We were both inspired by classic musical theater tropes and having fun with that as well. And I think what ended up happening because of that is a is an interesting blend of like classic musical theater and, and totally just alternative comedy absurdness yeah but it feels like it it works because of the familiarity as alex was saying of, of that musical theater ride mm-hmm. um so we're and- not coming at you with anything too zany that it can't be absorbed like that yeah. And Valen's background is more in the pop sphere, I guess you'd say. Um, so the musical influences uh, are, are really interesting. I think it's it's less like traditional musical theater and and more into that um, that boy band world at times. Um, and Valen is really able to to do all of those styles. So we get to use all of those styles in the show, which is really cool. What I want the audience to get out of this very special Christmas musical um, <laughs> is is like a different perspective, I think, on on what it means to be not just an artist, but somebody with a dream mm-hmm. um, and the full story of what that dream is. Because oftentimes I think the story ends at, at when the dream comes true instead of the very real aftermath of what that means to, to, um, to assign value of, of your life to this thing um that represents success so i think that there's there's something in that but also i would just love people to have a good time it's a fun ride every time we get on it um you know those themes are in there but you wouldn't know it to begin with we don't want the audience to feel like there's any responsibility of of getting anything bigger out of the show than just the fact that it it is absurd so (laughs) first and foremost laughing and um <laughs> laughing and having fun with the songs and the ride uh you know it's it's a it's a roller coaster yeah i mean i think valentina said that beautifully um we yeah we just want people to have fun we want people to maybe learn a little bit about in sync and give chris kirkpatrick the respect and uh, yeah. admiration that he is due because he did start that band and um it, some people it seems like that information was like not widely known for a long time because he wasn't the breakout star you know that justin timberlake became for example but chris kirkpatrick is the reason that that band existed um and and he is just a very um impressive person and we you know want to we, we we respect him greatly and we hope that everyone else does too part of the original idea and, and this was always our our motive for doing a show as well as is no one has told this story about chris before yeah and it felt like the more research we did um accidental at first but then became an obsession especially for allison allison it became really important for her and then for me for it to be historically accurate. And it is. Yeah, so, we, we, We've taken um, some, some liberties, you know, it, like the fact that it's set in Los Angeles at this particular time and, you know, all of the guys are there. Like that's, you know, 
not probably how it was actually going on, but the events of NSYNC's history that we talk about and a lot of little references along the way, there's there's a lot there. Um, there's like an iceberg underneath of kind of deep cuts for the people who do know the NSYNC history. And uh, for people who don't, um, it, it does guide you really, I think, really smoothly along their their history. It's the the facts of what happened and particularly with Chris's story is so interesting on its own. Mm -hmm. Uh, We probably didn't need to add all the Christmas stuff to it for it to be an interesting story, but it it, it is a fun fun twist. Yeah. Well, we can make a formal invitation right now. Um, (laughs) In sync, if you were listening to this, you are invited. We have reserved seats for you every night. Um, Also, we do know that they know of it. Um, Chris's manager came to our opening night uh, over the summer when we were doing Fringe. Mm-hmm. Um, and she was very supportive. She did ask why we did this. <laughs> <laughs> Fair question. Um, yes, but was, you know, very, uh, how do you say it? I think that it, she was, she loved it. Yeah, I think, you know, it's a, it, I think she appreciated it because it's it's true and it's it's positive and it you know it's uh, you know I I, I don't, I've, as Valen said people aren't talking about this story and it's worth talking about um, and we we did you know we let them know that we were doing the show again and they were very supportive of that as well so um, so yeah we we would love for everyone to come see the show anyone who wants to just you know email us <laughs> and in our long term dreams we would love for them to play these parts or maybe play play each, each other. other. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe Justin can play Chris and Chris can play Justin and really switch it up. Be exciting. Who knows? Anything can happen. (laughs) I think it really does feel like a ride when you're performing it. So I think that, you know, the thing that I look forward to the most is having fun and having that, Mm -hmm. that back and forth with the audience. Cause it's a relationship, you know, um, they they're trusting you to take care of them through this story and they're they're letting you know that it's working through claps and laughs, laughs. and that give and take <clears throat> i come from the music world and a lot of my artist music is quite serious i would say it's been in a mm-hmm. lot of dramatic tv and film type things um so being able to do a comedy has been so refreshing for that reason um to be able to have that that relationship and that back and forth with the audience. Um, I like, I don't typically get to sing songs where people laugh. Um, so it's, it's been really exciting for me and really stimulating. And that's what I look forward to. Yeah. For me, it's hard to separate writing from the performance of it because I do, you know, when, when the audience laughs at a line, um, it's I, the writer part of my brain is just like, check. You know, um, but at the same time, I think as an actor, I feel the best when I when the show goes by so quickly and I don't even know, you know, I it's it, there are these moments where you're you're so invested in it and you're so present that like you kind of lose the awareness of um, the fact that you're, you know, crouched on this hardwood stage in the middle of West Hollywood and you're just having this experience and that it's such a fun when you it doesn't always happen. But when you when you manage to get on that roller coaster and it goes and you're with it and you're just in it at the end of it, you're like, I don't even know what just happened. But like, yeah, that feeling as an actor is is that's what I that's what I love. Um, And it can be challenging to, you know, wear so many hats because there's not as much time to um, just to just to focus on the acting um, part of it, which is, you know, probably the most fun part but uh but I really do appreciate that like there are times when it's when I'm on stage with Valen and we're having this moment and it's just like all of a sudden we're like <laughs> yeah you know we're here and we're we, we're doing this thing that we said we were going to do and I I'm just so proud and honored that we get to do it it can be really trippy at times because you know we started writing this 10 years ago and um when we were writing it, we would imagine as we were writing it, what it would kind of feel like to be on stage doing, you, you, you imagine the story with that in mind. Yes. And there are times where I'm on stage with Allison and we're doing a scene together as Chris and Marky Mark. 
and it's just the way that we imagined it. And, but it's real, it's real life. Yeah. Um, and that is weird. <laughs> but I'm here for it. <laughs> Um, but there will be these little moments. I felt it last night, Allison. I don't know if you did when we were on our last scene together mm-hmm. where we were wrapping things up and I was just like, like I had this moment. I was like, yeah, that's there's my best friend. Like yeah. we did it. We're on stage. That's our yeah. last scene. We did it. We did um, it. So there is, there's something incredibly uh, fulfilling and satisfying about um, seeing what we're made of with this project. Yeah. You should attend even if you know nothing about it sync, but you should especially attend if you do. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the It's a Wonderful Life and a Christmas Carol thing, really, we, we have found works for any age, especially like older than the typical NSYNC fan. Yeah. Um, you should see the show if you want to laugh. Like we've had a hard couple of years as like a species, you know, this is yeah. a good time, I think, to escape and... I am so proud that our show is able to do that for, for people. It seems at least for us, like we're having so much fun doing it that it's been very cathartic. Yeah. And you should see the show also um, to kind of, we have some pretty cool people who have worked on this show, some Broadway mm-hmm. folks. Uh, we have Taylor Williams and Josh Milliken. And Taylor is our music director. He uh, did a lot of the arranging that Valen can speak the music language a lot better than I can. All the orchestrations. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Josh is our sound designer. And they are both Broadway guys. Um, yeah. So we're so incredibly uh, lucky to have them for this. What was supposed to just be a cardboard box musical but now has been legitimized a little bit by these incredible talents. We are really passionate about bringing it over there. Valen and I actually met in Edinburgh. Um, we be- we met uh, online. Uh, Valen was already living over there and I moved over there after college. And I was looking for a place to live at the exact moment when she happened to be looking for a roommate. And she advertised on Gumtree, which is kind of like their version of Craigslist. And I saw the ad and responded. And that is where all of this began. It was this weird twist of fate. Um, So for us, going back to Edinburgh personally is this full circle moment. But it also, I mean, the Edinburgh Fringe is, you know, the the biggest fringe festival in the world. And it's the one, it's the most, it's so exciting. There's all this opportunity. So many amazing shows kind of got their start at Edinburgh, including Six, which uh, Josh is now working on. Um, And for us, we feel as though this show would do really well there we're so excited to bring it there and introduce it to that audience um and see where it goes after that i want as many people to see me in red camo pants as possible (laughs) (laughs) i think our goals for the musical i we have so many we're just starting out and we don't really know how it's going to go or where it's going to go there's a version of it where we um we do the show in LA at Christmas every year, which would be super fun. There's a version of it where, you know, we we bring it to Chicago or New York and do it there. There's a version where we go to Edinburgh and we end up doing it in London, which would be, I, I would I would die. Um, that would be amazing. Um, but, you know, we just don't know yet. We're just starting out. We're so open to whatever possibilities we get with it. We just, as Valen said, we want as many people as possible to come see it and to enjoy it. And yeah, we'll we'll, we'll take this ride wherever it goes. Yeah. Sharing it is really now that it's done and because we, you know, for so long couldn't show people this because it wasn't done. Yeah. But we had been working on it so long. We had so many fragments of the of it and um, it didn't really make sense out of context <laughs> as much as we li- would have liked it to to other people. So it's just really nice also to be able to finally pull back the curtain and be like, you know, that thing that we've been yeah, the thing we've been talking about, about for done 10 years. <laughs> we've had a, I've had some friends come to the show and they were like, afterwards, you know, they were very complimentary and um, they were saying things like, yeah, like Valen played me demos like eight years ago. And I was like, what is going on? But, you know, just not believing that we were actually continuing to work on this, but they were very pleased with the end result um, and happy that we did. That's been it's been fun to show people what what the absurdity turned into. Yes, exactly. I'm Valen Shore. Um, and you should come see this musical. We're at Chris Kirkpatrick Miss Musical on Instagram. And you can 
find our websites and ticket links at www.chriskirkpatrickmiss.com. Or you can just Google Chris Kirkpatrick Miss or try and I think it will come up now. Uh, yeah, I'm Allison Zada and I... And we'd love for you to join us at the Edinburgh Fringe in August. We would love to see you there. It's super fun. And uh, we'd love for you to, to, you know, follow along with the show and see where we go next. Who knows? Only one way to find out. Follow us. That's the way. I know at Edinburgh, there are so many options, right? You're inundated with with so many shows to see and and all kinds of things, like not even just shows, right? Performances and acts and clowns and, you know, all the things. Why come see Breakup Addict? Well, I play over 20 different characters during the show, including the voices in my head when I am on dates with people, when I'm inside of relationships and something, we get into a fight or something happens. So uh, it is absolutely laugh out loud, LOL, entertaining. And it's also really educational. So it not only will make you laugh and feel things, but it will also leave you with a sense of, wow, you know, like that felt like therapy or wow, I didn't know that about myself. And I know a lot of people don't go to the theater for that purpose. But if you're really interested in personal growth and personal development and learning more about yourself and learning to love yourself deeper, this is the show to see. Hi, I am Paige Wilhide. I am the writer, star of and producer of Breakup Addict. And it is a solo show where I play over 20 different characters, including the voices in my head and some of my ex-boyfriends. Uh, if you want to learn more, watch the show. After Hollywood Fringe, I'm like, okay, what's next? You know, like what's the next step here? And I really feel like there is there is a lot of momentum with my show Breakup Addict. And um, it's I'm feeling energized about it. I'm feeling ready and and really want to ride that momentum. So I am taking it to Edinburgh Fringe Festival in August. I'm going to be performing all of August, which is very different than Hollywood Fringe. So um, Edinburgh is a daily performance at the same time every day. So I'm going to be at 4.30 every day at the Gilded Balloon Teviot location uh, in Edinburgh. And it's August 2nd through 27th are the dates. So Literally throw a dot, throw a dart at August, and uh, you'll be able to come see Breakup Addict in Edinburgh. I think when when there's like a really true piece of art that comes through you, it can't be ignored, and that's kind of how I ended up writing writing Breakup Addict. So I um, I went through two quite tumultuous uh, heartbreaks. Uh, back to back with very unavailable people like they were they were very different but also had so many similarities to these two these two situations and um and as I was realizing that there was like that I was the common denominator in both of those situations I was like okay I need to change something it's not them it's like what can I change in order to uh in order to be better and have better relationships so I started going to uh meetings as part of a 12 step program for sex and love addiction. And I worked with a sponsor and my sponsor told me that for the first 30 days, I was not to interact with any love interests at all, which generally for me are men. And um, so I was in withdrawal from my favorite drug men. Uh, and, and I did that for 30 days and then 60 days. And it really took me into uh, an identity crisis. Like I, I realized that I had, it's like I had piled my identity on top of this idea that I am valuable. I am loved if a man loves me, if somebody else approves of me and likes me. And, um, and when that like peace, when that like core belief crumbled, everything else did too. So I spent a lot of time in isolation. I was in a depression. I was eating a lot. I was like, just trying to find other vices to kind of like, like fill the, the void that I didn't have. Cause I had all this, you know, I was not talking to men. Um, and during that time I started writing. Like that was another, that was a way that I, that I really tried to cope with some of these feelings. And I wrote down my stories. I wrote down what I was going through. 
Um, and then I met my coach, Jessica Lynn Johnson, and she helped me piece all the puzzle pieces together into, into a solo show. And, um, and I really channeled all of that, like excess power and, and energy that I would have just put out into the world into like trying to be in a relationship or get love or sex, like all that energy I could now channel into my art and into Breakup Addict. So Breakup Addict opens with me, my character of Paige, uh, sitting in a 12-step meeting in her very first one and is having a, uh, is kind of seeing herself for the first time in a really uh, eye-opening and painful way and seeing like, oh, you all are sex and love addicts and I think I might be too, but I don't want to be. And so there's like that that admission that starts the show, and then it travels through different stories, how she got there, um, and then eventually like looking at some of her patterns in relationships. And the the thread of the story is it tracks through the 12 characteristics of sex and love addiction. And even if you don't consider yourself a sex and love addict, even if you um, don't consider yourself an addict in general... The characteristics of sex and love addiction, I think, are something that everybody can relate to in some way or another. Um, so, so those are really ways that I like to use. Um, they're like, um, they're like pillars that I like to use throughout the show, anchors to support people in seeing themselves and their own patterns and their own relationships in my story. So it tracks through that, and then eventually. Um, you know, I, I come to a realization that I need to be on my own for a little while. And I, and I make like a really hard choice to set boundaries with some of these men and to, to really take care of myself and go on a self-love journey. And it kind of comes around the other side for me, uh, me like loving myself again. It's really my hope that every audience member walks away feeling changed in some way. And when I say changed, it's like, it's like, oh my God, Paige saw a part of me that I have not wanted to talk about or share or, or that I didn't really want the world to see. And she put, she gave me so much love and approval for that thing that I can now work with it. I can now like take that, you know, that deep fear that I had that I would be alone forever. This is just an example, but like, you know, that deep fear that I had that I would be single and alone forever. And I can now share that with somebody or I can go get therapy or like I can work with a coach and get some support um, or I can like read a book or listen to a podcast. Right. So so I want people to walk away feeling like a part of them got really touched and and fully seen and loved in, in my show. And, um, yeah, it's, uh, that would be, that would be like the greatest gift ever. You know, what I've, what I've uncovered on my healing journey is we heal when the parts of ourselves that feel the most unlovable are seen and fully loved. So the parts of ourselves where, we feel shame or we feel guilt for walking away from that relationship or we feel so alone because everybody around us is engaged and getting married and having babies and we're still single. So these are just some examples. But, um, you know, it's like the, the, the little tiny parts of us where we feel like we, that we can't love fully, right? Healing happens when someone else gives us permission to love that part. And that is, that's ultimately what I want to create with this show is giving parts, giving people permission to love parts of themselves that they previously would be hiding or ignoring or trying to run away from. Um, and I think that really, that is how you take pain and turn it into power rather than taking pain 
and suffering, you know, choosing the suffering route. This is like taking pain and turning it into power. I did that through my show, through writing down my stories. You know, I, I was in such a dark time and um, I really alchemized that into this beautiful, like moving piece of art. And um, and I think the art is just going to continue living on, you know, it's going to have its own, um, its own, it's going to be become its own body of work. I don't know exactly how, because I, I, it's, it's not up to me anymore. You know, it's really up to like the people who see the show and, and the people who are moved by it and what they get from it and being able to like carry on the message. Um, but at the end of the day, yeah, it's like, really, can I, can I love the parts of me that I think are the most unlovable? My, my desire for when I am on stage during Fringe is to be so fully present in my body that I'm not thinking. That I am just like letting the lines and the characters, oh my gosh, I'm getting chills and like tears are coming to my eyes as I'm thinking about this, but like just letting it move through me in the most present way. Like there's... um. I talk, I talk about higher power and God and the universe, you know, in my show and being connected to spirit. And I think one of the reasons that I love performing so much is because that's when I feel most connected to spirit is in that, in that moment. And so, yeah, my hope is that I really get to fully be out of my head and fully just like channel the, the art through me. If you've ever experienced heartbreak, if you've ever been in a relationship where you are wondering where you went, if you've ever left a relationship wondering who you are, uh, anybody who's dating, <laughs> it's like, like this is this is really for people who feel like they are wanting to be seen in their relationships and in their dating life. Um, you must go see Breakup Addict if you have ever been through heartbreak, if you've ever walked away from a relationship and wondered, what happened? Where did I go? Who am I now? How am I going to rebuild from this place? Uh, if you've ever been dating and you wake up and you're like, what am I doing? You know, how do I do this? If you've been resistant to dating, if you've um, ever been scared to put yourself out there and be vulnerable with somebody, this show is for anybody who is in relationships, wants to be in relationships, has just come out of a relationship. It is uh, a really powerful way to be entertained, right? You're going to laugh. You're going to feel things. You're going to cry. It's a really entertaining play that also will leave you with something. It's like, you're not just, you're not just going to a play for 75 minutes and then you leave and go to dinner and like forget the next day. This play like lives on through you. Um, and, and it will continue to, to bring its lessons and bestow its gifts upon you as, as you're digesting it, you know, after the show. And, um, and I really encourage you to bring a friend to it so you can talk about it after, because there's so much to get and, uh, and you definitely won't regret coming to see Breakup Addict. When I first thought about going to Edinburgh, I was like, no way. <laughs> like, that's too much. That's like, I'm going to die. I think I might die uh, performing that many times. And then as I thought about it more and as I was sharing the show with people and doing a few like preview performances here in LA, uh, what I realized is that this message needs to be out there and needs to reach as many people as possible. And truly, I see so many opportunities for the show to go like a hundred different directions in terms of what it can offer audiences. So um, Edinburgh is the place for me to, to like actually really 
hone the show, like perfect the show, get to know it in a way that that I don't yet, you know, and I can't even see at this point. Um, but not only that, it's also a way for me to um, explore what's possible, you know, to explore what's possible with the show and, and where it could go from here. Um, and the other thing is I get so inspired by other artists. So to be around some of the top performers in the world, top theater performers, top actors and singers and clowns and, you know, every every performance artist uh, who's who's got just like oodles of talent bursting out of them um, for the opportunity to be around people like that in a community like that. Oh my gosh, like that's that's so worth it. Like I I can't not go to Edinburgh. You have to come out and support these artists. There is such a range of talent. I'm blown away by the amount of talent that is in this festival. The amount of uh offerings the 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 different types and flavors and varieties of shows different lengths of shows different styles different kinds of people uh it is it's yeah it's a transformational experience to be able to have access to all, like this this entire uh array of of performances and live theater and listen we've all been so digital, you know, we've all been like caught on our computers for the last few years and, and in our homes and the, the magic of live theater is something that we were not able to access when we're on zoom, you know, when we're like in the virtual digital world, there is a, there is an unmatched magic that is created inside of a live theater experience. And you have an opportunity to go to that and to see it and to experience it and to like let it inspire you and your art and move you. So see as many shows as you can. It is, it's going to be a wild, fun time. I'm Paige Wilhide. I am the writer, star of, and producer of Breakup Addict, which is going to be at Edinburgh Fringe Festival all of August, August 2nd through 27th. Uh, so come see me at the Gilded Balloon Teviot. I will be in the billiard room every day at 4.30. You can get your tickets at the Edinburgh Fringe website, or you can go to breakupaddict.com to get your tickets and come say hi to me after the show. If you're near Edinburgh, if you're anywhere in the UK and have a lot of time, I think you should come to my show at the Edinburgh French Festival. Come see a shark at my penis. It's really weird. It's not something you've seen before. It's going to teach you a lot about trans history, which will make you look very cool in conversations. And whether you are trans or not trans, I think you will learn about yourself along the way as well. So come, come on down. It's going to be fun, I promise. Hey there, it's me, Laser the Boy. And I have a show called A Shark at My Penis that's at the Edinburgh Fringe this summer. I'm starting on August 8th and I will see you every day. I just brought it out of the Hollywood Fringe Festival in June in LA. I'm having a really good time with it and I hope you will come see it. But first, you've got to watch this video to learn more. I love musicals so much. I think the reason is, if I'm to dig into my own psychology, is that I really like people explicitly saying how they feel because i have a hard time reading human emotion <laughs> so uh you know like they say a, a musical in a musical you burst into song when you can no longer s speak like the emotion is too strong and i think so frequently in real life when the emotion gets too strong and we can no longer speak we just stop and we go and hide um but in a musical you can have this opportunity to tell people how you're feeling and to process those feelings um also, I just love musicals. I love the music. I love listening to it. You know, I've been a big like Disney musicals fan. You know, Alan Menken is my hero since I was a, a, a little baby boy. It's just the stuff that has always made the most sense to me. So um, it, it feels like both harder than, 
you know, straight theater in that you have to write songs and you have to figure out how to, you know, mic them and put music. But it's also to me just like an easier way to tell stories because you can just say exactly what you're thinking and the corniness is part of it. I have wanted to bring a show to Edinburgh for a really long time. It's a thing that I first heard of um, through other comedy musicians. Helen Arney, Axis of Awesome, um, told me that it is just the best place to do shows. And I was it had an opportunity to go um, for a couple days a few years ago and had the best time of my life. It's an enormous festival with a you know three thousand shows, eight thousand shows, whatever it is, happening all the time, and everyone is just so enthusiastic and so excited and so gleefully weird. Uh, it just felt like the kind of place I would fit in. The show I'm doing Fringe this year is called A Shark Ate My Penis, a story of guys like me, a history of guys like me. Um, it's a show about trans men through the past. And the reason uh, I wanted to write it is I, I have been reading um, especially one book called Female Husbands by Jen Mannion. And it told these stories of these guys who were trying to live their truth, you know, from 1700 to 1900 in a world where there wasn't, the word transgender didn't even exist, right? Um, but at the same time, their stories are so similar to mine and so relatable, uh, you know, on an emotional level and on, a, you know, a logistical <laughs> level of how do you, try to get people to see you as a man um, and how do you get through your life and how do you find a, a woman who wants to be with you even though you may not have you know the life that people are expecting given the way you look um, and it was just it immediately hit me in the face of like I have to write a musical about this I have to tell these people stories because the songs that they would sing are the same songs that I would sing um, about their feelings and their struggles the main story of the musical is is mine. It's a story about me and how I came out as trans and how why I didn't come out earlier, um, which is kind of the big mystery for me because when I look back, it's everything is so obvious. Uh, so it's it's going through that and then diving into the stories of these role models of these guys throughout history and how their stories are pretty much the same as mine, um, and also uh, dealing with transphobia and people who say that it's not real and and the internalized transphobia that comes from you know being a member of this society which is represented by uh, jk rowling in the show so we have it's it's the the actual plot has a lot of time travel has a lot of conversations has a lot of songs but ultimately it's just a a story told in a funny way about my journey my my goal with this show and what I want the audience to get out of it is catharsis. Um, I, I don't like shows about queer trauma, so I try to keep it light and try to, the point of it is, hey, we have always been here and here are some stories that you may not know from history. And also the struggle that we have of, of defining our identities and finding the right label. Um, is both universal and not the end all be all, right? It's you just, just being yourself and knowing who you are is enough. And that's my goal with the show, whether you're trans or not. Um, I hope that you can learn something and also learn something about your own journey on the way. If you're near Edinburgh, if you're anywhere in the UK and have a lot of time, I think you should come to my show at the Edinburgh French Festival. Come see a shark at my penis. It's really weird. It's not something you've seen before. It's going to teach you a lot about trans history, which will make you look very cool in conversations. And whether you are trans or not trans, I think you will learn about yourself along the way as well. So come, come on down. It's going to be fun, I promise. If you're not familiar with Edinburgh Fringe, it is an incredible event. I believe it's the biggest arts festival in the world. And most of the shows are people doing the same show every day from August 2nd to 28th, I believe are the times this year. So you're gonna see people at the top of their game doing the weirdest stuff you can imagine. Um, if you've never checked it out, it, I mean, either as a performer as or as an attendee, it's, it's life-changing. You're gonna see all kinds of stuff that you've never seen before. And even just walking around on the Royal Mile during the festival is, 
it's just an experience unlike any other. It's a lot of work and it's a lot of fun. It's a good way to just collect flyers if you're really into that. <laughs> um, and, uh, and yeah, just to see artists, you know, the top comedians from around the world doing amazing stuff. So I raised money for my show using Kickstarter. It's, I, you know, I think this is probably my 10th Kickstarter. Uh, I'm a big Kickstarter guy. Um, and I also uh, I help other people run Kickstarters just because I think independently funded stuff, stuff funded by crowds is, um, is a really wonderful way to get stuff made that wouldn't otherwise get made and really important things. Um, at the moment, uh, if folks want to support my journey, I have a chip jar on my website and I have, you know, music you can buy. My artist name is Laser the Boy. Um, I'm going to have some fun uh, Shark Ate My Penis related merch and such. Also, I have cute buttons. Um, so if you want to if you want to help out, I would really appreciate it. Um, and I'm very thankful for, to the folks who already contributed so much because Edinburgh Fringe is going to be real expensive, but very exciting. I think the, if I had to say something additional about the play or the, the festival, I would just say, get out and go, go look at the website and the catalog of shows and just find some stuff that appeals to you because um, chances are there's going to be somebody who wrote a show that you never knew you needed. I'm Laser Weber, creator of A Shark Ate My Penis, and you should come see it at Edinburgh. I'm going to be at the Gilded Balloon Teviot every day at 6 p.m. or 1800 hours and you will be able to uh, enjoy that it's it's pretty cheap it's a really good time and i hope you'll come out